Hi everybody. So uh, let's talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors, which used to be the new kids on the block, but now they're no longer the new kids on the block because there's newer kids in oncology. And maybe in two years, we are going to record about those new kids. Um, but the immune checkpoint inhibitors came to change cancer care forever. Before we used to use poison to kill good and bad cells to help our patients. And that poison was chemotherapy. Immune checkpoint inhibitors came from the understanding that we all produce cancer cells, but our immune system are able to identify the cancer cells and send it to apoptosis. But why some patients do not have this, it can be many reasons. It can be uh, certain checkpoint genes that have been mutated, like T53. That's a very common one that we know. So people have BRCA mutations, and which is a DNA breakage. But we know that immune checkpoint inhibitors have the capacity to turn off the off switch. How is that? Well, we have a connection between our T cells and the antigen presenting cells. And there is a connection between PDL1, this is the most common, and the ligand. When the T cell comes to the cancer cell and or the antigen presenting cell and is trying to identify what kind of cell this is. The cancer cells have a mechanism of defense in which the ligand is activated, it attaches to the PD-1, and then the cancer cell looks like a regular cell. So the, the T cell gets deactivated and goes and wanders somewhere else. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are monoclonal antibodies that go to those ligands and attach to it. So when the T cell comes to the cancer cell, the off switch is turned off. So the T cell gets activated and produces a whole immune related activation that allows them to identify the cancer cells for what they are. It's mostly T cell and B cell regulated. There's some data about effects in the humoral immune system, but mostly of what we know is cellular immunity. So this is an, al an analogy that I explain to my patients. Currently, Without the immune checkpoint inhibitor, everybody looks like it's playing for the same soccer team. Everybody is playing for the Barcelona or the Real Madrid. I'm not gonna get controversial here. Everybody looks, everybody's wearing the same shirt. The monoclonal antibodies come and they say, oh, you are an imposter. And we're gonna make sure that the referee knows that you don't play for Barcelona. You actually play for Milan. And then we're gonna kick you out. That's how immune checkpoint inhibitors work, and that's how I explain it to my patients. Of course, you could use any sport you want, and South American, so I use soccer, but I have used the same analogy for football, American football. So you can, we are in Boston, so you can use the Patriots if you want. Right now they're not doing great, but that's a different conversation. So they turn off the off switch, and our immune system is able to do what it's supposed to do. That was a really helpful analogy. Um, and in that same vein, what mechanisms are at play when these immune-related adverse events occur? The simple answer is we don't fully understand yet because not everybody develops immune-related adverse events. But we know it has to do with autoreactivity. So these T cells that are activated, you know, some of them become autoreactor to our own tissue, right? So they try to find fake soccer players where they're not. And these ligand also self to protect normal tissue. But when the ligand is attached to the antibody, to the immune checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab, atisoluzumab, call it, that ligand also doesn't allow to identify normal tissue. There's also some theories about uh, this regulation of the T cell, B cell family. We are an ecosystem. So when it's a deregulation of T cell activation in B cells, we know that the outer reactivity increases. And it's all secondary to inflammation. That's what I told my patients. Sometimes, another analogy, because I'm the doctor of analogies, I want my patients to understand everything. Every family has a black sheep, right? So these are your T cells. They're doing a great job. They're attacking your lung cancer, but every family has a black sheep. So sometimes a hyperactivated T cell identifies your thyroid gland as an infiltrator or a spy and goes and attacks the thyroid gland like it's an infection. So it's an outer reactivity, T cell hyperregulation, T and B cell disbalance. 
And we do know that the microbiome may play a role, but this data is still very early because we have seen differences in immune-related adverse events based on patients' diets and their own microbiome. So we are still trying to understand the immune system. The drugs are approved and they're being widely used because they're helping so many people, but we don't fully understand it. But the answer is T-cell mediated. Does this um, dysregulation of the immune system also make the patient more susceptible to infection or not really? So there's two data sets. Um, I think one is that we learn a lot from the pandemic. So in the treatable uh, registry, and I'm also a member of the steering community of the Cancer and COVID-19 Consortium, that is the largest consortium about COVID-19, we learned that patients in immune checkpoint inhibitors did not have higher rates of infection with COVID-19 and did not have worse mortality at 30 days for hospitalization. There are other factors that accounted for high mortality, like having lung cancer, right? Or having COPD as a baseline or obesity. We know about obesity. But when we control by the type of therapy, targeted therapy in immune checkpoint inhibitors did not worsen mortality with COVID, did not increase the chances of COVID infection. That's from the COVID kind of background. For the bacterial infections, which is something that we have to differentiate, is this pneumonitis or this is pneumonia, mm -hmm. right? We do know that patients may have higher risk of certain infections, but it also comes for the immunosuppression that cancer gives you by themselves. Because we knew that patients with cancer, even without starting, before starting chemotherapy, are at a higher risk of infection. So I think it's an add-on situation. I told my patients, sometimes your T cells are very busy with your tumor, and we see these skin infections often. So I think bacterial infections may be an increased risk, but there's a lot of confounders, because right now there are 18 different indications for immune checkpoint inhibitors. So I treat lung cancer, right? Melanoma, the patients are very different, the patients, my patients that respond to immunotherapy that tend to have a previous heavy tobacco exposure those are the patients that respond the most to immunotherapy compared to the patients with triple negative breast cancer that also benefit from immunotherapy. So I think the risk of infection is very patient independent because my patients with COPD, they're already a high risk for pneumonia on their own. Yeah, that's, that's really um, helpful. And I think it's important to keep in mind that not all types of immunosuppression is, is the same. Cancer patients can have like various different risk factors. Um, someone with like a hematologic malignancy might have different ones than um, solid tumors as well. So something I want to add to is that sometimes we use chemoimmunotherapy up front. And so patients are only in immunotherapy or immune checkpoint inhibitors. So that also mm -hmm. plays a role in infection. So in lung cancer, we start with four cycles of chemo and immune checkpoint inhibitors. So there is the highest risk, right? They're immunosuppressed for the cancer. They are getting a platinum-based chemotherapy, so they're neutropenic, you know, then you have the immune checkpoint inhibitor. So also depends on the journey, what time of their journey the patients are. Are they getting it with chemo or without chemo? So melanoma, patients with melanoma only get immune checkpoint inhibitors. Chemo does nothing for them. So the risk of infection is lower. Triple negative breast cancer, lymphoma, lung cancer, bladder cancer, they tend to get it in combination with chemotherapy. So the confounding factor needs to be taken into account and in what part of the patient's cancer journey they are. Did they just go the four cycle of chemotherapy? They would get an infection if somebody sneezes on them. But if they're at a year and 18 months in immunotherapy, very different conversation. Could you please discuss the organs or systems that are commonly affected by IRAs and um, some of the less frequent ones as well? So the take home message is that anything can be affected by immune checkpoint inhibitors when it comes to immune related adverse events. There is nothing that it can not have. But let's talk about the general ones. Well, the general ones are fatigue. Fatigue is the most common side effect with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we often forget because it can get to a grade three in which the patient is just bed bound and it's only the immunotherapy. So while these drugs are great, they can have these common side effects. So fatigue, 
nausea is very common. We often see how these drugs are publicized, like, oh, it's better than chemo. Mm, I don't think they're better. Chemo, I think it's just a trade-off. And a skin rash, itchy skin rash. It's like an eczema kind of skin rash. It's red, macular, papular. I'm not gonna try to describe that anymore because every time an internist describes a rash, a dermatologist hears <laughs> a little bit of blood somewhere. So I'm just gonna go through like erythematous macropapular rash that's pruritic. It's as much as you get from me. Those are the most common. Rash, fatigue, and nausea. Let's go over the second tier of common. Glands. Glands are the second most common. And all the glands, thyroid particularly in women. And that's what we have to have baseline TSH because one out of eight women, we have some degree of hypothyroidism. So women should have TSH before they start these drugs. So hypothyroidism. But something important with the thyroid is the thyroid gets T cells, right? They get very angry. They go and migrate to the T to the thyroid and produce thyroiditis. So initially with thyroiditis, you will see a decrease in TSH and an increase in T4. And it's a hyperthyroid picture, right? Over time, that thyroid burns down and it becomes hyperthyroid. That's why you have to follow patients and be very careful before you start the hormone. Because if you start it too soon, you're going to get into a very hyperthyroid state. But if you wait too long, they become very hypothyroid. I have a patient that I saw her and her TSH was higher than 100. And I was like, I... I didn't even want to know what was higher. They don't read it higher than 100. So it needs to be monitored. The thyroid is very common. Another gland that can be commonly affected that is often missed is the adrenal glands. So fatigue needs to be monitored very closely. So the patients, we have, um, you know, the same concept. Some of them can have this burst of energy and then they crash later. And Weight loss can be seen with adrenal insufficiency. And something that I really notice in these patients, they all feel very dizzy when they stand. And the cortisol in these patients, because many of them get steroids as free medication for chemo, most of them need a stimulation test. So I've seen, I have to remind, remember all of that uh, and how to read them. But you also can talk to the endocrinologist. I talk to them. So we talk about glands, thyroid. We talk about the adrenal glands as the most common, and then the pituitary. These tend to be a little bit more traumatic because it tends to be a central hypopituitarism. So everything goes down. But one of the things is the hormones half-life varies. So at the beginning, you may see these patients doing okay with certain hormones, but other hormones are low. And it's just a matter of time. And this is an oncology emergency. These patients need a whole brain MRI. And the fourth gland is the pancreas. So you can have pancreatitis and you can have diabetes type 1. Those two are very rare, but they're life-training events. So those are the glands. Um, now let's talk about solid organs. So it's the lungs, pneumonitis. And the thing about the pneumonitis is that it can come all of a sudden. You can be doing fine, and then in two days the patient is like, I'm very short of breath, they can have wheezing. So patients can have low grade fevers. Again, it's a T cell mediated process. So pneumonitis can happen. Let's talk about another solid organ, hepatitis. These patients, you need to rule out common things before you blame it on the immune checkpoint inhibitor. And one of the most common things in patients with cancers is complementary medicine. I write book chapters and articles. I do grants about complementary medicine. I believe in it, but I also believe in honesty and destigmatize it. So when I see a patient with liver dysfunction, my first question is, did somebody send you a message via Facebook that you should try a tea? <laughs> and sometimes it's yes. So I have seen a lot of patients that have been called hepatitis induced by immunotherapy. But it has to be, sometimes it's complementary medicine. So I'm very good med rec is very important. Patients with cancer, they want to do everything they can. And that includes teas, alkaline water, coffee ground enemas, these pills here, this influencer there. Um, so it's good to rule out that. And we have to rule out the common culprits, right? So hepatitis virus needs to be done. 
and high alcohol consumption and also high acetaminophen intake. So a lot of patients with cancer have metastasis to bone and they can take a lot of acetaminophen. So hepatitis is very common. You will see ASD and ALT to be elevated at the same time. As it rises from grade one to grade three, then the bilirubin follows. And that's when we get in trouble. And the final solid organ is the colon. And that's colitis. Something important, the colitis pattern tends to be nonstop diarrhea. So the, the patient wakes up in the middle of the night for bowel movements. That's very something characteristic of this diarrhea. The patient doesn't get better with the Amodium because some patients may take Amodium for many reasons or because they have it at home. And it's just very quick. It's 8 to 12 bowel movements from two days ago when you have one bowel movement a day. 8 to 12 bowel movements. And these patients can decompensate very quickly when it comes to colitis because it's dehydration, poor intake, you know, and nothing gets absorbed. And the colonic wall gets very edematous and you have a risk for ruptures, like, which is rare, but it can happen. There is, of course, nephritis, which is an inflammation of the kidney, rare. Cerebritis, everybody likes to talk about cerebritis, but I've seen one case, younger woman, and myocarditis. The situation with myocarditis is rare, but tends to be fatal if it's missed. So you can see changes in the EKG. I know, right? I went to oncology for the <laughs> EKG, to be honest. Um, but go back to mu-related adverse events. They can happen any time, even after patients have um, stopped therapy. And we have timelines. So the skin rash is the first thing that you will see, right? The first three weeks. Pneumonitis is very unlikely to happen with one dose. It tends to happen with second doses. And hepatitis tends to happen with dose two and three. So you can, even the timing of the patients, can you can have an idea by the history. Uh, if the patient go to the immunotherapy that day and they have diarrhea, it's very unlikely that the, their T cells are prime right now. It's very unlikely. You need time. Immunotherapy, the median time for any response is around six weeks. So if you start immunotherapy today, you're not going to have a tumor effect in six weeks because those T cells need to be activated. And that's what timing of the side effects also makes. is a very important aspect when you, you're in the ER and the patient's like, oh, I go chemo immunotherapy today. You can blame it on the chemo then. Yeah. And so is there a time after which you would say like the chance becomes so low that you would put it lower on your differential? Two years after the last dose, if you're telling me the chances are low, but there is one to 2% of patients that get immune checkpoint inhibitors that are called as sectional responders. We don't fully understand that. And I have a few of them. These are patients that there's two groups of sectional responders. Ones, these ones that have a horrible immune related adverse event. I had this lady that had this bad pneumonitis and I got her out of the ICU. She was intubated and I like, Never going to let immunotherapy touch you again. Where her T cells were prime so much that she is right now two years. This is stage four lung cancer, you know? And now she has two years of immune checkpoint inhibitors with no evidence of cancer. So we had those exceptional responders. I have another patient that I re-challenged for colitis. Colitis came back. And I saw him last Thursday, and he has other problems, but the lung cancer is no one of them. It used to be a stage four. Well, I guess it still is. So we still had that one to two percent of patients that their immune system gets prime permanently, and they don't need therapy. One to two percent only. No, they're very rare. But we never saw that in lung cancer. That a stage four patient I see every three months without therapy is very rare. So that's what we don't understand. This. Fully because why is those patients that get two doses and they kill all the cancer and they do well, you discontinue the immunotherapy, they go and get a heart attack years later um, or something else that we die of, but you have all these patients that don't respond at all. And, and we have a marker called PDL1. But the problem with the PDL1 is it's a dynamic marker. It gets upregulated and that regulated. And we have been using it as a categorical variable. And it's not right. 
we I have patients that I have biopsy in two different sites and I have two different PDO ones. And I have patients that I have radiated and I biopsy again and the PDO one is high, so the radiation upregulates the PDO one. So we don't have a gray market to identify who's who.